Hello, everyone. This is John, your sleep storyteller. Before we jump into tonight's story, I just wanted to take the time to let you know that I have started a Patreon, and if you are able to, it would mean the world to me if you subscribed. For as little as $3 a month, you can gain access to my new sleep stories before they reach YouTube, as well as access to the full archive of sleep stories available now. Higher tiers give you access to the raw audio files of all my sleep stories, which you can download and listen on your own device with your screen turned off. I, for one, fall asleep much easier when my environment is completely dark, and hopefully this will help you as well. The highest tier gives you voting power and the ability to request future sleep stories. You'll even get a producer's credit at the end of my videos. So if you have the means and would like to help out a small content creator and help grow the channel, please head over to patreon.com slash John's Sleep Stories and subscribe today. Thank you. Now, without further ado, Hello there. My name is John, and I am here to bring you a sleep story. So find some place comfortable, lie back, let your arms and legs fall slack at your sides. Take a deep breath and close your eyes. Tonight, the road goes ever on into the histories of Middle Earth as we continue with The Silmarillion by J. R. R. Tolkien. Chapter 10 of The Sindar Now, as has been told, the power of Elwë and Melian increased in Middle-earth, and all the elves of Beleriand, from the mariners of Círdan to the wandering hunters of the Blue Mountains beyond the River Gelion, owned Elwë as their lord. Elu Thingol, he was called, King Greymantle, in the tongue of his people. They are called the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Starlit Beleriand, and although they were Moriquendi, under the lordship of Thingol and the teaching of Melian, they became the fairest and the most wise and skillful of all the Elves of Middle-earth. And at the end of the first age of the Chaining of Melkor, when all the earth had peace and the glory of Valinor was at its noon, there came into the world Luthien, the only child of Thingol and Melian. Though Middle-earth lay for the most part in the sleep of Yavanna, in Beleriand under the power of Melian, there was life and joy, and the bright stars shone as silver fires. And there in the forest of Neldoreth, Luthien was born, and the white flowers of Nifredil came forth to greet her as stars from the earth. It came to pass during the second age of the captivity of Melkor that dwarves came over the blue mountains of Erid Luin into Beleriand. Themselves they named Khazad, but the Sindar called them Naugrim, the stunted people, and Gonhirim, masters of stone. Far to the east were the most ancient dwellings of the Naugrim, but they had delved for themselves great halls and mansions, after the manner of their kind, in the eastern side of Erid Luin. And those cities were named in their own tongue Gabilgathal and Tumunzahar. To the north of the great height of Mount Dolmed was Gabilgathal, which the elves interpreted in their tongue Belagost, that is, Mickleburg, and southward was delved to Munzahar, by the elves named Nogrod, the Hollowbold. Greatest of all the mansions of the dwarves was Kaza Doom, the Dwarodelf, Hadhadrond in the elvish tongue, that was afterwards in the days of its darkness called Moria. But it was far off in the mountains of mist, beyond the wide leagues of Eriador and to the Eldar came but as a name and a rumor from the words of the dwarves of the Blue Mountains. From Nogrond and Belagost 
The Naugrim came forth into Beleriand, and the elves were filled with amazement, for they had believed themselves to be the only living things in Middle-earth that spoke with words, or wrought with hands, and that all others were but birds and beasts. But they could understand no word of the tongue of the Naugrim, which to their ears was cumbrous and unlovely, and few ever of the Eldar have achieved the mastery of it. But the dwarves were swift to learn, and indeed were more willing to learn the elven tongue than to teach their own to those of alien race. Few of the Eldar went ever to Nogrod and Belagost, save Aeol of Nan Elmoth and Maeglin his son. But the dwarves trafficked into Beleriand, and they made a great road that passed under the shoulders of Mount Dolmed and followed the course of the river Askar, crossing Gelion at Sarn Athrad, the ford of stones, where battle after befell. Ever cool was the friendship between the Naugrim and the Eldar, though much profit they had one of the other. But at that time those griefs that lay between them had not yet come to pass, and King Thingol welcomed them. But the Naugrim gave their friendship more readily to the Noldor in after days than to any others of elves and men, because of their love and reverence for Aule and the gems of the Noldor they praised above all other wealth. In the darkness of Arda, already the dwarves wrought great works, for even from the first days of their fathers, they had marvelous skill with metals and with stone. But in that ancient time, iron and copper they loved to work, rather than silver or gold. Now Melian had much foresight, after the manner of the Maiar. And when the second age of the captivity of Melkor had passed, she counseled Thingol that the peace of Arda would not last forever. He took thought, therefore, how he should make for himself a kingly dwelling, and a place that should be strong, if evil were to awake again in Middle-earth. And he sought aid and counsel of the dwarves of Belagost, they gave it willingly, for they were unwearied in those days and eager for new works. And though the dwarves ever demanded a price for all that they did, whether with delight or with toil, at this time they held themselves paid. For Melian taught them much that they were eager to learn, and Thingol rewarded them with many fair pearls. These Círdan gave to him for they were got in great number in the shallow waters about the Isle of Balar. But the Naugrim had not before seen their like, and they held them dear. One there was as great as a dove's egg, and its sheen was as starlight on the foam of the sea. Nymphelos it was named, and the chieftain of the dwarves of Belagost prized it above a mountain of wealth. Therefore the Naugrim labored long and gladly for Thingol, and devised for him mansions after the fashion of their people, delved deep in the earth, where the Esgalduin flowed down and parted Neldoreth from Region. There rose in the midst of the forest a rocky hill, and the river ran at its feet. There they made the gates of the Hall of Thingol, and they built a bridge of stone over the river, by which alone the gates could be entered. Beyond the gates, wide passages ran down to high halls and chambers, far below, that were hewn in the living stone, so many and so great that that dwelling was named Menegroth, the Thousand Caves. But the elves also had part in that labor, and the elves and dwarves together, each with their own skill, there wrought out the visions of Melian, images of the wonder and beauty of Valinor beyond the sea. The pillars of Menegroth were hewn in the likeness of the beaches of Orome, stock, 
bough, and leaf, and they were lit with lanterns of gold. The nightingale sang there as in the gardens of Lorien, and there were fountains of silver, and basins of marble, and floors of many-colored stones. Carven figures of beasts and birds there ran upon the walls, or climbed upon the pillars, or peered among the branches, entwined with many flowers. And as the years passed, Melion and her maidens filled the halls with woven hangings, wherein could be read the deeds of the Valar, and many things that had befallen in Arda since its beginning, and shadows of things that were yet to be. That was the fairest dwelling of any king that has ever been east of the sea. And when the building of Menegroth was achieved, and there was peace in the realm of Thingol and Melian, the Naugrim yet came ever and anon over the mountains, and went in traffic about the lands. But they seldom went to the Thalas, for they hated the sound of the sea, and feared to look upon it. To Beleriand there came no other rumor or tidings of the world without. But as the third age of the captivity of Melkor drew on, the dwarves became troubled, and they spoke to King Thingol, saying that the Valar had not rooted out utterly the evils of the north, and now the remnant, having long multiplied in the dark, were coming forth once more and roaming far and wide. There are fell beasts, they said, in the land east of the mountains, and your ancient kindred that dwell there are flying from the plains to the hills. And ere long the evil creatures came even to Beleriand, over passes in the mountains, or up from the south through the dark forests. Wolves there were, or creatures that walked in wolf shape, and other fell beings of shadow and among them were the orcs, who afterwards wrought ruin in Beleriand. But they were yet few and weary, and did but smell out the ways of the land, awaiting the return of their lord. Whence they came, or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild, in which they guessed all too near, it is said. Therefore Thingol took thought for arms, which before his people had not needed, and these at first the Naugrim smithied for him, for they were greatly skilled in such work, though none among them surpassed the craftsmen of Nogrod, of whom Telkar the smith was greatest in renown. A warlike race of old were all the Naugrim, and they would fight fiercely against whomever aggrieved them, servants of Melkor, or Eldar, or Avari, or wild beasts, or not seldom their own kin, dwarves of other mansions and lordships. Their smithcraft, indeed, the Sindar soon learned of them. Yet in the tempering of steel alone of all crafts, the dwarves were never outmatched, even by the Noldor. And in the making of mail of linked rings, which was first contrived by the smiths of Belagost, their work had no rival. At this time, therefore, the Sindar were well armed, and they drove off all creatures of evil, and had peace again. But Thingol's armories were stored with axes, and with spears and swords, and tall helms, and long coats of bright mail. For the hauberks of the dwarves were so fashioned that they rusted not, but shone ever as if they were new burnished. And that proved well for Thingol in the time that was to come. Now, as has been told, one Lenwe of the host of Olwe forsook the march of the Eldar at the time when the Teleri were halted by the shores of the great river upon the borders of the westlands of Middle-earth. Little is known of the wanderings of the Nandor whom he led away down Anduin. Some, it is said, dwelt age-long in the woods of the Vale of the Great River. Some came at last to its mouths, and there dwelt by the sea. 
And yet others, passing by arid Nimrais, the White Mountains, came north again and entered the wilderness of Eriador, between arid Lewin and the far mountains of Mist. Now these were a woodland people, and had no weapons of steel. And the coming of the fell beasts of the north filled them with great fear, as the Nalgrim declared to King Thingol in Menegroth. Therefore Denethor, the son of Lenwe, hearing rumor of the might of Thingol and his majesty, and of the peace of his realm, gathered such host of his scattered people as he could, and led them over the mountains into Beleriand. There they were welcomed by Thingol, as kin long lost that return, and they dwelt in Osiriand, the land of seven rivers. Of the long years of peace that followed after the coming of Denethor, there is little tale. In those days, it is said, Dairon, the minstrel, chief lore master of the kingdom of Thingol, devised his runes, and the Naugrim that came to Thingol learned them, and were well pleased with the device, esteeming Dairon's skill higher than did the Sindar, his own people. By the Naugrim, the Kirth were taken east over the mountains, and passed into the knowledge of many peoples. But they were little used by the Sindar for the keeping of records, until the days of the war. And much that was held in memory perished in the ruins of Doriath. But of bliss and glad life there is little to be said before it ends, as works fair and wonderful, while still they endure for eyes to see, are their own record, and only when they are in peril or broken forever do they pass into song. In Beleriand in those days the elves walked, and the rivers flowed, and the stars shone, and the night flowers gave forth their scents, and the beauty of Melion was as the noon, and the beauty of Luthien was as the dawn in spring. In Beleriand King Thingol upon his throne was as the lords of the Maiar, whose power is at rest, whose joy is as an air that they breathe in all their days, whose thought flows in a tide untroubled from the heights to the deeps. In Beleriand still at times rode Orome the Great, passing like a wind over the mountains, and the sound of his horn came down the leagues of the starlight, and the elves feared him for the splendor of his countenance and the great noise of the onrush of Nahar. But when the Valaroma echoed in the hills, they knew well that all evil things were fled far away. But it came to pass at last that the end of bliss was at hand, and the noontide of Valinor was drawing to its twilight. For as has been told, and as is known to all, being written in lore and sung in many songs, Melkor slew the trees of the Valar with the aid of Ungoliant, and escaped and came back to Middle-earth. Far to the north befell the strife of Morgoth and Ungoliant, but the great cry of Morgoth echoed through Beleriand, and all its people shrank for fear. For though they knew not what it foreboded, they heard then the herald of death. Soon afterwards Ungoliant fled from the north and came into the realm of King Thingol, and a terror of darkness was about her. But by the power of Melion she was stayed, and entered not into Neldoreth, but abode long time under the shadow of the precipices in which Dorthonion fell southward. And they became known as Ered Gorgoroth, the Mountains of Terror, and none dared go thither, or pass nigh them. There life and light were strangled, and there all waters were poisoned. But Morgoth, as has before been told, returned to Angband, and built it anew. And above its doors he reared the reeking towers of Thangorodrim, and the gates of Morgoth were but one hundred and fifty leagues distant from the bridge of Menegroth, far and yet all too near. 
Now the orcs that multiplied in the darkness of the earth grew strong and fell, and their dark lord filled them with great lust of ruin and death. And they issued from Angban's gates under the clouds that Morgoth sent forth, and passed silently into the highlands of the north. Thence on a sudden, a great army came into Beleriand and assailed King Thingol. Now in his wide realm, many elves wandered free in the wild, or dwelt at peace in small kindreds far sundered, and only about Menegroth in the midst of the land, and along the Phalas in the country of the Mariners were their numerous peoples. But the orcs came down upon either side of Menegroth, and from camps in the east between Kelon and Gelion, and west in the plains between Sirion and Narog. They plundered far and wide, and Thingol was cut off from Círdan at Eglarest. Therefore he called upon Denethor, and the elves came in force from Region beyond Aros and from Osiriand, and fought the first battle in the wars of Beleriand. And the eastern host of the orcs was taken between the armies of the Eldar, north of the Andram, and midway between Aros and Gelion. And there they were utterly defeated, and those that fled north from the great slaughter were waylaid by the axes of the Naugrim that issued from Mount Dolmed. Few indeed returned to Angband. But the victory of the elves was dear bought, for those of Assyrian were light-armed and no match for the orcs, who were shod with iron and iron-shielded, and bore great spears with broad blades. And Denethor was cut off and surrounded upon the hill of Ammon Ereb. There he fell, and all his nearest kin about him, before the host of Thingol could come to his aid. Bitterly though his fall was avenged, when Thingol came upon the rear of the orcs, and slew them in heaps. His people lamented him ever after, and took no king again. After the battle, some returned to Osiriand, and their tidings filled the remnant of their people with great fear, so that thereafter they came never forth in open war, but kept themselves by weariness and secrecy. And they were called the Lyquendi, the green elves, because of their raiment of the color of leaves. But many went north and entered the guarded realm of Thingol, and were merged with his people. And when Thingol came again to Menegroth, he learned that the orc host in the west was victorious, and had driven Círdan to the rim of the sea. Therefore he withdrew all his people, that his summons could reach within the fastness of Neldoreth and Region. And Melion put forth her power, and fenced all that dominion round about with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment. The girdle of Melion, that none thereafter could pass against her will or the will of King Thingol, unless one should come with a power greater than that of Melion the Maya. And this inner land, which was long named Eglador, was after called Doriath, the guarded kingdom, land of the girdle. Within it there was yet a watchful peace, but without there was peril and great fear, and the servants of Morgoth roamed at will, save in the walled havens of the Phalas. But new tidings were at hand, which none in Middle-earth had foreseen. Neither Morgoth in his pits, nor Melion in Menegroth, for no news came out of Amman, whether by messenger, or by spirit, or by vision in dream after the death of the trees. In this same time, Feanor came over the sea in the white ships of the Teleri, and landed in the firth of Drengist, and there burned the ships at Losgar. Chapter 11 Of the Sun and Moon and the Hiding of Valinor It is told that after the flight of Melkor, the Valar sat long unmoved upon their thrones in the Ring of Doom. But they were not idle, as Feanor declared in the folly of his heart. 
For the Valar may work many things with thought rather than with hands, and without voices in silence they may hold counsel one with another. Thus they held vigil in the night of Valinor, and their thought passed back between Ea and forth to the end. Yet neither power nor wisdom assuaged their grief, and the knowing of evil in the hour of its being. And they mourned not more for the death of the trees than for the marring of Feanor, of the works of Melkor, one of the most evil. For Feanor was made the mightiest in all parts of body and mind, in valor, in endurance, in beauty, in understanding, in skill, in strength and in subtlety alike, of all the children of Iluvatar. And a bright flame was in him, the works of wonder, for the glory of Arda, that he might otherwise have wrought, only Manwe might in some measure conceive. And it was told by the Vanyar, who held vigil with the Valar, that when the messengers declared to Manwe the answers of Feanor to his heralds, Manwe wept and bowed his head. But at that last word of Feanor, that at the least the Noldor should do deeds to live in song forever, he raised his head, as one that hears a voice far off, and he said, So shall it be, dear bought those songs shall be accounted, and yet shall be well bought, for the price could be no other. Thus even as Eru spoke to us, shall beauty not before conceived be brought into Ea, and evil yet be good to have been. But Mando said, and yet remain evil, to me shall Feanor come soon. But when at last the Valar learned that the Noldor had indeed passed out of Amman and were come back into Middle-earth, they arose and began to set forth in deeds those counsels which they had taken in thought for the redress of the evils of Melkor. Then Manwe bade Yavanna and Nienna to put forth all their powers of growth and healing. And they put forth all their powers upon the trees, but the tears of Nienna availed not to heal their mortal wounds. And for a long while Yavanna sang alone in the shadows. Yet even as hope failed and her song faltered, till Perion bore at last upon a leafless bough one great flower of silver, and Laurelin a single fruit of gold. These Yavanna took, and then the trees died, and their lifeless stems stand yet in Valinor, a memorial of vanished joy. But the flower and the fruit Yavanna gave to Aule, and Manwe hallowed them, and Aule and his people made vessels to hold them and preserve their radiance, as is said in the Narsilion, the song of the sun and moon. These vessels the Valar gave to Varda, that they might become lamps of heaven, outshining the ancient stars, being nearer to Arda. And she gave them power to traverse the lower regions of Ilmen, and set them to voyage upon appointed courses above the girdle of the earth from the west unto the east, and to return. These things the Valar did, recalling in their twilight the darkness of the lands of Arda, and they resolved now to illuminate Middle-earth, and with light to hinder the deeds of Melkor. For they remembered the Avari that remained by the waters of their awakening, and they did not utterly forsake the Noldor in exile. And Manwe knew also that the hour of the coming of men was drawn nigh. And it is said indeed that, even as the Valar made war upon Melkor for the sake of the Quendi, so now for that time they forebode for the sake of the Hildor, the aftercomers, the younger children of Iluvatar. For so grievous had been the hurts of Middle-earth in the war upon Otumno, that the Valar feared lest even worse should now befall. 
whereas the Hildor should be mortal, and weaker than the Quendi to withstand fear and tumult. Moreover, it was not revealed to Manwe where the beginning of men should be, north, south, or east. Therefore the Valar set forth light, but made strong the land of their dwelling. Isil the Sheen, the Vanyar of old named the Moon, flower of Telperion in Valinor, and Anar the Fire Golden, fruit of Laurelin, they named the Sun. But the Noldor named them also Rana, the Wayward, and Vasa, the Heart of Fire, that awakens and consumes. For the sun was set as a sign for the awakening of men and the waning of the elves. But the moon cherishes their memory. The maiden whom the Valar chose from among the Maiar to guide the vessel of the sun was named Arian. And he that steered the island of the moon was Tilion. In the days of the trees, Arian had tended the golden flowers in the gardens of Vanna and watered them with the bright dews of Laurelin. But Tilion was a hunter of the company of Orome, and he had a silver bow. He was a lover of silver, and when he would rest, he forsook the woods of Orome, and going into Lorien, he lay in dream by the pools of Este, in Telperion's flickering beams and he begged to be given the task of tending forever the last flower of silver. Arian the maiden was mightier than he, and she was chosen because she had not feared the heats of Laurelin, and was unhurt by them, being from the beginning a spirit of fire, whom Melkor had not deceived nor drawn to his service. Too bright were the eyes of Arian for even the Eldar to look on, and leaving Valinor, she forsook the form and raiment, which like the Valar she had worn there. And she was as a naked flame, terrible in the fullness of her splendor. Isil was first wrought and made ready, and first rose into the realm of the stars, and was the elder of the new lights, as was Telperion of the trees. Then for a while the world had moonlight, and many things stirred and woke that had waited long in the sleep of Yavanna. The servants of Morgoth were filled with amazement, but the elves of the Outer Lands looked up in delight. And even as the moon rose above the darkness in the west, Fingolfin let blow his silver trumpets and began his march into Middle-earth and the shadows of his host went long and black before them. Tilion had traversed the heaven seven times, and thus it was in the furthest east, when the vessel of Arian was made ready. Then Anar arose in glory, and the first dawn of the sun was like a great fire upon the towers of the Pelori. The clouds of Middle-earth were kindled, and there was heard the sound of many waterfalls. Then indeed Morgoth was dismayed, and he descended into the uttermost depths of Angband, and withdrew his servants, sending forth great reek and dark cloud to hide his land from the light of the day star. Now Varda purposed that the two vessels should journey in Ilmen and ever be aloft, but not together, each should pass from Valinor into the east and return, the one issuing from the west as the other turned from the east. Thus the first of the new days were reckoned after the manner of the trees from the mingling of the lights when Arian and Tilion passed in their courses above the middle of the earth. But Tilion was wayward and uncertain in speed and held not in his appointed path, and he sought to come near to Arian, being drawn by her splendor. Though the flame of Anar scorched him, and the island of the moon was darkened. Because of the waywardness of Tilion, therefore, and yet more because of the prayers of Lorien and Este, who said that sleep and rest 
had been banished from the earth, and the stars were hidden, Varda changed her counsel, and allowed a time wherein the world should still have shadow and half-light. Anar rested therefore a while in Valinor, lying upon the cool bosom of the outer sea, and evening, the time of the descent and resting of the sun, was the hour of greatest light and joy in Amman. But soon the sun was drawn down by the servants of Ulmo, and went then in haste under the earth, and so came unseen to the east, and there mounted the heaven again, lest night be over long and evil walk under the moon. But by Anar the waters of the outer sea were made hot and glowed with colored fire, and Valinor had light for a while after the passing of Arian. Yet as she journeyed under the earth and drew towards the east, the glow faded and Valinor was dim, and the Valar mourned then most for the death of Lorelin. At dawn the shadows of the mountains of defense lay heavy on the blessed realm. Varda commanded the moon to journey in like manner, and passing under earth to arise in the east, but only after the sun had descended from heaven. But Tilion went with uncertain pace, as yet he goes, and was still drawn towards Arian, as he shall ever be, so that often both may be seen above the earth together, or at times it will chance that he comes so nigh that his shadow cuts off her brightness, and there is a darkness amid the day. Therefore, by the coming and going of Anar, the Valar reckoned the days thereafter until the change of the world. For Tilian tarried seldom in Valinor, but more often would pass swiftly over the western land, over Avathar, or Araman, or Valinor, and plunge into the chasm beyond the outer sea, pursuing his way alone amid the grots and caverns at the roots of Arda. There he would often wander long, and late would return. Still, therefore, after the long night, the light of Valinor was greater and fairer than upon Middle-earth. But the sun rested there, and the lights of heaven drew nearer to earth in that region. But neither the sun nor the moon can recall the light that was of old, that came from the trees before they were touched by the poison of Ungoliant. That light lives now in the Silmarils alone. But Morgoth hated the new lights, and he was for a while confounded by this unlooked-for stroke of the Valar. Then he assailed Tilion, sending spirits of shadow against him, and there was strife in Ilmen beneath the paths of the stars. But Tilion was victorious, and Arian Morgoth feared with a great fear but dared not come nigh her, having indeed no longer the power. For as he grew in malice and sent forth from himself the evil that he conceived in lies and creatures of wickedness, his might passed into them and was dispersed. And he himself became ever more bound to the earth, unwilling to issue from his dark strongholds. With shadows he hid himself and his servants from Arian, the glance of whose eyes he could not long endure. And the lands near his dwelling were shrouded in fumes and great clouds. But seeing the assault upon Tilion, the Valar were in doubt. Fearing what the malice and cunning of Morgoth might yet contrive against them, being unwilling to make war upon him in Middle-earth, they remembered nonetheless the ruin of Almaren, and they resolved that the like should not befall Valinor. Therefore, at that time, they fortified their land anew, and they raised up the mountain walls of the Pelori to sheer and dreadful heights, east, north, and south. Their outer sides were dark and smooth, without foothold or ledge, and they fell in great precipices with faces hard as glass, and rose up to towers with crowns of white ice. A sleepless watch was set upon them, 
and no pass led through them, save only at the Kalakiria. But that pass the Valar did not close, because of the Eldar that were faithful. And in the city of Tyrion upon the Green Hill, Fenarfon yet ruled the remnant of the Noldor in the deep cleft of the mountains. For all those of elven race, even the Vanyar and Ingwe, their lord, must breathe at times the outer air and the wind that comes over the sea from the lands of their birth. And the Valar could not sunder the Teleri wholly from their kin. But in the Kalakiria they set strong towers and many sentinels, and at its issue upon the plains of Valmar a host was encamped, so that neither bird nor beast nor elf nor man, nor any creature beside that dwelt in Middle-earth, could pass that leaguer. And in that time also, which songs call Nortale Valinoreva, the hiding of Valinor, the enchanted isles were set, and all the seas about them were filled with shadows and bewilderment, and these isles were strung as a net in the shadowy seas, from the north to the south, before Tol Eresia, the lonely isle, is reached by one sailing west. Hardly might any vessel pass between them, for in the dangerous sounds the waves sighed forever upon the dark rocks shrouded in mist, and in the twilight a great weariness came upon mariners and a loathing of the sea. But all that ever set foot upon the islands were there entrapped, and slept until the change of the world. Thus it was that as Mandos foretold to them in Araman, the blessed realm was shut against the Noldor. And of the many messengers that in after days sailed into the west, none came ever to Valinor save one only, the mightiest mariner of song. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this sleep story, feel free to leave a like and a comment. If you would like to support the channel further, you could subscribe to my Patreon. Link is in the description. If you would like to hear more sleep stories like this, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for all notifications. I upload a new story each and every week. Thank you again for listening, and pleasant dreams. Good night.